two. Welcome back, WNST, Dallas and Baltimore, and WNST.net. I must say that when I circled this one on the calendar, I was not sure it was going to be of this caliber. And uh, But I did know that I would catch up with some of my Buffalo friends here this week. This guy's written a lot of books. Um, probably embarrasses him, uh, much like it does Howard Balzer and other old friends when I say I read his work when I was a <coughs> younger man. He is a, a historian of all things in the National Football League, a longtime writer at the Buffalo News. News and Bills.com and Buffalo and Buffalonians and a pretty good football game we have going here, Vic Carucci. I mean, you have chronicled the history of the league, the history of the game, Hall of Famers and maybe Justin Tucker's one and maybe Marshall Yonder's one. But all of these years, Lamar Jackson is sort of one for the ages. It's sort of Fernando Mania coming to town, right? Yeah, I, a lot of excitement to see him. Uh, I, and I'm sure even, again, the, the, the staunchest Buffalo Bills fan is curious to see how their defense is going to match up against him, but how special a player Jackson is, how much fun he is to watch. Uh, for me, and, and you know, you talk about all these years I've been around the game, I equate it to watching Barry Sanders play, just that when I when you knew you had something incredible and that you would willingly even though uh as a working member of the press you're credentialed to sit in the press box and, and you don't pay for that credential but but that's the guy you'd pay the admission price for just to see him perform well, I do pay for my tickets. I sat out in the wet. I know your daughter was in town as well and watching the game, and you've chronicled the game a long time. This offense and the fact that it works, I mean, let's go to the heart of this, right? I mean, you're, you're around these franchises. You're around ownership. To sell an owner or a football person, or we're going to change our whole program to have a running quarterback. Uh, you know, uh, we, we can go through the history of racing quarterback. We can go through the history of winning quarterbacks and losing quarterbacks, but a, a a quarterback that runs 16 times and ran in the rain on Sunday and got hit out of bounds and got hit in the pocket, all this stuff. There's a reason a lot of teams didn't want to make this sort of a move, but when you make it, you commit fully to it. And I don't know that it's ever been run more like the orchestra that it's being run right now in the way that Greg Roman has drawn this up. I mean, it's been a lot of institutional courage on the part of the Ravens to make this happen, right? No question. Uh, first of all, we are seeing a, a larger picture of the position changing, the look of the position. And I'm not just talking about it from a, a racial standpoint. I'm talking about it from a performance standpoint. Buffalo Bills have a, an extremely mobile uh, running back style quarterback and a guy named Josh Allen. Uh, you look at Carson Wentz with the Eagles. He can make some things happen with his feet. This has changed the position, but dr more dramatically, obviously, Lamar has taken it to another level uh, to see the Arizona Cardinals make Kyler Murray the top overall pick of the draft. Uh, you know, you see what Deshaun Watson uh, is able to do and has done to, to make the Texans so dangerous, dangerous enough to beat the New England Patriots, uh, and, and then go down the list of, of other quarterbacks that we've seen, Russell Wilson, who bring the elements of movement but also movement to throw. It's not strictly their ability to run, but that danger of the run uh, and, and how offenses can build around it is huge. The other critical element to this is the marriage between a quarterback with that talent and a coordinator who knows how to make it work. And I think in Lamar Jackson's case, no one could have been better for him than Greg Roman. Uh, saw him here in Buffalo uh, what he got out of Tyrod Taylor, who's effectively, I mean, he's a backup now with the with the uh, Chargers, uh, was really an off-the-street kind of, you know, and he was a backup there in, in Baltimore, and he was really just a guy that, a guy that you didn't really know what else he had going for him, but Greg Roman uh, had the secret sauce to, to build an offense and make it work for him. Before that, he had done that with Colin Kaepernick in San Francisco. These are not coincidences. And the offseason that was spent in uh, w with uh, Lamar Jackson before this year, uh, after him, after he had come in and spent obviously most of last year uh, in the regular season behind Joe Flacco, but getting realizing what they what they can do with the guy, and and then there's a third component as it applies to the Ravens in my book, and that is the dominance of an overall run game to have the 
not just the talent in the backfield, but that big, physical, imposing offensive line. And I think when you, when you put all of that together, defenses don't really know how to handle it because they, they are worried about more than one thing, always concerned about what Jackson can do when he takes off or throws. But then, oh, yeah, they could, they could get uh, you know, uh, 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 hammered by uh, Mark Ingram and, and, this, uh, and Marshall Yonda in this offensive line. Vic, I mean, you, you wrote books with smart people, you know, and uh, John Gruden and uh, Fred Smurlis, and, uh, you know, and you're always trying to find the smartest person in the room. Last week, and I've told this story once on the air, but I'll tell it to you because you'll appreciate it. Eric Weddle, who's one of the great minds of the game, a beautiful mind, Eric Weddle, right? Last week, after the game, came out shaking his head after losing 45-6, to getting run over by this kid that he practiced with last year, watched him, watched him run scout, watched him play, you know, all of that. And, and after getting freight train said, we can, we can watch all the tape you want. You don't know where the ball's going. You can't see right. the ball. You physically don't know where the ball is when there's bodies in front of you. And before you even know where the ball is, Pat Ricard's out on you, Boyle's out on you, Ronnie Stanley's, somebody's out on you, and he's gone. And then you have to worry about the next guy, and then you realize when you're in the secondary, I am the next guy. You, you, you know, So yeah. you're always trying to keep him in front of you, and you find yourself flat because you don't see the ball. Yeah. It, that, that's huge, uh, and and it's it's a testament to uh, certainly to what we describe in the way of the humanity in front in front of him. But it's a bigger testament to Lamar Jackson's uh, handwork. I mean, just just the way he can sleight of hand, if you will, uh, the way he knows how to operate has mastered the ability uh, with those play fakes. Uh, and and I think you know you think to to some of the greatest quarterbacks. That, that have played this game, go back to Peyton Manning and the work he did with play fakes. That was like one of the, the most masterful parts of his game. And you ask any defender who dealt with him, and that was a point of frustration. Tom Brady at his best could do that when he has a running game, which he doesn't have now, but uh, that was another element. But I don't know that anybody did it better than Manning until I, I watched this young man, Lamar Jackson, and I think um, he, he's right up there when it comes to that. Another interesting thing is, you know, hearing uh, Eric Wood uh, talk about, uh, of course, the former Bills center, and he's on the Bills radio broadcast as an analyst now, but he's a Louisville guy uh, and, and you know, obviously followed Lamar through his career there. But he was telling me the recruiting coordinator had told him that he that when, when he first, this was 2015, he says, got somebody, we, we got a guy coming in and he's special. And he was talking about Jackson. Uh, coming from uh, Boynton Beach Community High School, and he said, this guy can be, you know, is, is going to be special. He goes, and, and, and then you hear that, and then, of course, he could have played as a true freshman, but he didn't. And why? Because Bobby Petrino did the right thing by letting him pass. And then there's you know, a level of patience in Baltimore, even though this guy is obviously was touting as a rookie, but you know, his, his uh, breakout has happened this year. And, and I think that, that there's something to be said for that because what you learn in the hand movement things, the feet movement, the reading of, of defenses, the idea of, and, and then the scheming that Roman does, Greg has so many optical illusions out there, right? I mean, think about this. He, he will set things up. Sometimes that motion means nothing. And sometimes it's just to figure out and give uh, uh, the ability of Jackson to see or, or make these linebackers move so Jackson can get an edge there and the entire offense. So, uh, again, you marry it all together, um, and, and you come up with what, you're de- what we're describing as, as something really special. Vic Carucci, uh, he's had a pretty special career writing about the National Football League. He's a Bills NFL writer at BNBlitz.com as well as at Sirius XM if you heard him driving around there. He also votes for the Hall of Fame and at WGRZ in Buffalo for all Buffalonians. Um, you know, this is an exciting time for Bills football, right? I mean, we, we can talk about Lamar and we got the, you know, the new flavor in town. We got Michael Jordan here and the Beatles and all that wrapped up. We're coming to town, but everybody I've talked to 
It feels like they're the first time any of you in Buffalo or Miami or the Jets can smell a little bit of blood in the water in Foxborough for any of us who've had to go to Foxborough on a bus and try to win in January or, you know, as you guys have tried to do in September, October, November, December, that it feels like that thing's slowing down. You've already taken that cheap shot at their running game after they lose on Sunday night. You know, it, it feels like a different kind of tournament coming up, and it feels like the Bills are going to be a big, big part of the tournament over the next three weeks as to whether they're 9-6 and six a couple of weeks from now or 11 and something to go, you know uh, th- this yeah. is this is a turning point couple of weeks for Josh Allen and for how far Sean McDermott's brought that program right well th- this is the most interesting December I can remember for the AFC East uh and, and, and you know it's seemingly forever uh because even when the Bills made the playoffs back in uh 2017 and you know that story the miraculous Bengal victory <laughs> over the Ravens, that was the only way they got in. You're welcome, uh, by the way. I hope the wings they, tasted good. They, well, and, and the thing is, as, as, as exciting as that was for the fan base, it caught the, the guys in charge by surprise. Sean McDermott, Brandon Bean, the GM, no way were they planning on having a playoff team that year, uh, so their schedule was not ready for this. They feel that now, though, that they that they the pieces, this, this has been a remade team, nine new offensive starters including four new offensive linemen from 2018. Uh, the defense has stayed intact. The only missing component there as a starter uh, was uh, was Kyle Williams. The only He retired. So they only changed there. So 10 returning starters there, and that's been a factor, the experience of the continuity. Um, but the Patriots look more vulnerable than I've seen them in a long time. And as much as you know, we saw... Tom Brady Sunday night uh, yelling uh, at, at receivers to do their thing. And I get it, and, and it's fair for him to go there. But I, I think there's a culpability and accountability there. I don't think he's the same. I don't think he's reacting quite the same. And I think uh, on top of what's not happening around him, the trust that he doesn't have in missing parts, uh, that, that's a problem for him. Uh, and this defense, by the way can also get gashed at times, as great as it's been. Uh, and we saw that, of course, against the Ravens. And, and, and they nearly and should have lost to the Buffalo Bills at Buffalo, but for a block field goal. So, you know, uh, you, uh, excuse me, a block punt. block punt recovered for touchdown by New England. That was the difference, really, in a game that Buffalo uh, should have had. So I see vulnerability. Uh, and I see an improvement on Buffalo. I think they had their, they, they've been improving right along, but the, the, the coming out party for them was Thanksgiving against the Cowboys. Josh Allen is playing at, at, at the top of his game, never had more confidence in himself. Uh, and, and what Brian Dayball has done, you, you, we talked about Greg Roman. Well, Brian Dayball, the, the, the coordinator in Buffalo now, uh, running a up tempo, no huddle attack. I think that's key against the Ravens, by the way, against, they try to keep that defense off balance. And Dave also, for the last three games, moved himself from the sideline to the coaching booth upstairs. That has given him a different perspective. And I think that has made a huge difference in how this offense has functioned because he's pushing, he's able to push, I think, the, the, the do a better job of pushing the right buttons because of his perspective, what he can see. Vic, you talk so much about our offense and how unorthodox and, you know, all the parts that had to go into it and having the kind of guys like Willie Sneed at wide receiver who want to block and like blocking. You know, all of these guys are involved in that. You know, your organization went a different way, right? I mean, they went traditional passer, Wyoming, taking a chance on a kid that that nobody believed in, right? Like, that that kid's got a chip uh, the size of Wyoming on his shoulder. Right? Uh, you know, no one scholarshiped him. Like, uh, other teams passed him by, and yet he's moved to the front of the passing guy class for what they've tried to build. The Bills have tried to build something more traditional there, right? Well... I actually, uh, you know, the, the short, I mean, you can, you can say that when you look at six foot five, uh, you know, and, and big frame, big, strong, powerful guy, you think pocket passer, but he does not qualify as a traditional pocket passer at all. You'll see the athleticism that this guy has. He can run, he can do incredible things like, uh, on a, on what was supposed to have been a handoff on, on the Thanksgiving, uh, game in short yardage. Uh, fumbles the ball, picks it up, 
in the middle of all these bodies, I mean, he's got teammates and cowboys all around him, and and literally lunges his way. Uh, he was a yard behind the line, lunges his way three yards to pick up a first down, uh, and it really was a crucial. It was the turning point of the game because it set up the winning, uh, the go-ahead touchdown in the, in that game. This decisive moment. Uh, and that touchdown came on a gadget play, as you saw, the double reverse where John Brown, by the way, became the first receiver in Buffalo Bills history to throw a touchdown pass. But back <laughs> to your point about, yeah, uh, he wasn't, he was not heavily, Josh Allen was, for his inaccuracy in college. That's, that's for sure. Uh, and then he was, uh, you know, his accuracy issues continued into this year, into last year, and into this year. Uh, but he's improved that. Uh, they, they worked on his footwork to try to help that. But again, in, in addition to all of those, those elements, he can, he can run. I mean, he can definitely, uh, keep defenses off balance with his ability to run. And I think that's what you gotta look at. I'm not comparing it to Jackson's running. No one compares to that. But for a six foot five guy, when he gets moving, let me tell you, Nestor, it's it's something to watch. Well, certainly the Ravens, uh, they smell the, the potential in Smokey Brown, right? I mean, they brought him around to be that guy for Joe Flacco in an offense where they didn't run the ball, and they had bad down and distances and all of that. Uh, but clearly, the Ravens did a nice job of scouting out Smokey Brown because whatever he is, he's been special sauce to Josh Allen in that offense, right? Yeah, no question. Brown is, is the key addition there. Josh was you know, the ability that he has and, and what, what they have yet to consistently figure out, and, and this would be part of the evolution, uh, is connecting on those deep throws uh, because uh, Josh, and I think he's been coached, they've been trying to coach him back. So they sort of, <laughs> they worked at coaching him out of interceptions because he had six in his first four games this year, and it became such an issue uh, that he was starting to, on deep balls, just throw it, heave it as far as he could for fear that if he underthrew the receiver, he'd throw an interception. So th- that's been something that they've worked on. Uh, he's gotten a little better at that. He definitely has cut down his interceptions a lot. But I, I don't, uh, you know, I, I think it went from being fearful of throwing the interception to backing away to now being more uh, precise. Uh, but I, I, w- I would hesitate to tell you that he's figured it out with the deep ball consistently. Uh, he worked on especially trusting the underneath patterns, and Smokey can make those plays, but the Cole Beasley addition, picking him up from Dallas, uh, so now it's you know Brown and Beasley as a two, two starter, and Beasley's um, effectiveness has increased in this no-huddle attack because now teams can't, substitute and get smaller coverage people on the field to deal with him. So many times he's matched up with a linebacker. Uh, and, and when that's the case, Beasley's going to, you know, win that one-on-one all the time. I know you uh, being a Hall of Fame voter, Vic, you're always looking that way and seeing who's next up. And I know the Frank Gore thing happened a couple weeks ago. You're going to see Marshall Yonda and Tucker come up. But but Frank Gore is a Hall of Famer, right? Like, talk about Brady's longevity. He has been that to running backs. There's no question, and you know I, I've heard a couple of of uh, folks, you know, point out that well, is it just longevity, um, and and is there, is is there more to it than that? Yes, <laughs> it's not just longevity. There's a lot more to it than that. Um, first of all, to play the running back position and last this this many years as a running back, 15 years in National Football League is just insane, uh, and and it, it's a testament. That, oh, you know, how well he has kept himself in, in top condition, taking care of his body. Uh, the work he did with San Francisco seems like eons ago, but that was, you know, that was important, uh, to their success that they were having at that time. And then, of course, he carries on with, with Miami, with, uh, with, with the, uh, Indianapolis, with Indianapolis and Miami. Um, and to come back from two reconstructed knee injuries, I mean, two, constructions on both knees is also ACLs also something you look at to say that this guy can still bring it uh, in, in, in a complimentary way. Devin Singletary, the rookie from Florida Atlantic is the, is the primary guy in that backfield, the biggest playmaker, but 
Frank Gore, when they're near their own goal line or in critical situations and they, and they want a trusted pro in there, they'll put him in there uh, to, to take good care of the football and, again, put him in there to, to help be a changer. Vic, they uh, icing down the beer on Friday and starting up the bonfires up there, getting the RVs loaded in, right? I mean, this is – Buffalo's waited a long time for one of these, right? Yeah, that, 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 you know, you know the tradition. They will start pulling in to, uh, you know, to the uh, parking lots uh, as early as Wednesday. Uh, you know, I'm sure people will start their treks even tomorrow from different places around the country I know, in those RVs. And it's so funny. I just had a, a long uh, Q&A conversation with Baltimore native by the name of Doug Flutie. Uh, and uh, we were we were chatting because the anniversary of just uh, Hail Flutie uh, play um, had just come up uh, about a week ago. And uh, so we were talking about his Buffalo years. And, and, he's, and I said, what sticks with you the most? He goes, what sticks to me the most is pulling in for work. In, in you know in the middle of the week and watching these people already setting up for you know a Sunday game like on Wednesday. <laughs> I mean, I love talking to Doug too, and I I love how you slide in Baltimore native because anytime he's on, he can fall into yeah. a little bit of a Baltimore accent for me and talk about crab cakes and stuff. So, uh, uh, oh, man, yeah. Doug Flutie, man, you're dropping all sorts of names here this week. Uh, you know, you you've got the you know centers that went to Louisville. You're uh, always a wealth of information, Vic Carucci. That's why I bring you on, man. It's what we do, right, Esther? We got we got to know it's around us, man. That's that's our job. <laughs> hey, man, t- take care. Please don't take it personally. Anybody up there in Chickawaga, Depew, or Amher, I still love all of you. Orchard Park, uh, North Tonawanda, I love you all. Just I had to go to Tokyo this week, but uh, but I'll be there in the aftermath of all of it, watching at three o'clock in the morning. And I I hear the NFL's international, Vic. I'm gonna I'm gonna test that theory in Seoul at three a.m. All right. All right, I want and I want a full report on on how that that all goes in so, live so, real time with noodles. I assure you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, buddy. Appreciate you. Vic Carucci, you can follow him out on Twitter. Uh, also, anywhere Bill's coverage is, he's written books. He's Vic Carucci. That's C-A-R-U-C-C-I. He's a survivor. I dig him. Sorry, I'm not going to have wings with him at the Anchor Bar and Beef on Weck in Labatt's. Uh, but, uh, I, yeah, I, you know, maybe, maybe sometime soon. Hopefully not in the playoffs. Hopefully all are coming here in the playoffs. Uh, I'm out in the bio, Toyota.com Audio Vault. I'm in Seoul and in Tokyo all week long. You're going to hear a bunch of Bill stuff. You're going to hear a ton of Baltimore Positive stuff, including our 100th episode of Baltimore Positive, uh, my, my Masson lecture. we got all sorts of stuff you're going to hear, as well as some great Baltimore Positive stuff as we get you ready for the Bills. Luke's on the backfield, same as, morning newspaper, all of that stuff still here. It's WNST. International, just like the National Football League. We are WNST.net, AM 1570, and WNST Taos in Baltimore, broadcasting internationally. We never stop talking. Baltimore Sports and Lamar Jackson.